Welcome to our second distinguished lecturer. My name is Abby Thompson. I think I'm hoping we have some some visitors in the audience. Uh, so behave yourselves. Um, I'm the director of the Cosmos program, and this is a weekly lecture for the month of July. And please take a minute to turn off your cell phones, all the dutiful RAs in particular. Everybody's cell phone is off. My cell phone isn't off, so please nobody call me during the course of the talk, because I'm not going to be able to figure that out in time. And I would like to introduce our speaker for today. Mark Harrison is a software engineer at Walt Disney Pixar. You might think that that would be interesting enough, but that's just his day job. <laughs> By day, the mild-mannered software engineer. By night, the guiding spirit behind do-it-yourself drones, the home for everything about amateur unmanned aerial vehicles. The website, which I highly recommend, is a great read with information on the legality and illegality of drones, lots of how to build information, and some cool videos. I particularly like the graphic, be careful as you do this, pictures and I recommend them to all of our engineering type clusters. There seem to be a lot of blood, and these are just the friendly drones. There's an AP News report posted there I'm gonna read a little bit of, so from the, from, uh, the Associated Press, sharp-eyed dog walkers along the San Francisco Bay waterfront may have spotted a strange looking plane zipping overhead recently that looks strikingly like the U.S. stealth drone captured by Iran in December. The four and a half foot wide aircraft built by software engineers Mark Harrison and, and Andreas Osterer in their spare time can fly itself to specify GPS coordinates and altitudes without any help from a pilot on the ground. A tiny video camera mounted on the front can send a live video feed to a set of goggles for the drone's view of the world below. It's just like flying, Harrison said, without all the trouble of having to be up in the air. Um, for those of you that just were up in the air, that's cluster two? Yeah. Um, of course, going up in the air is also fun. I can testify to that. Um, the site includes updates on the laws regarding drone usage, which is a pretty hot topic right now, as you probably know. Here's the latest from Texas. And this should give all of us pause for thought. The Texas Privacy Act makes it a misdemeanor to use aerial drones to film any person or private property with the intent to conduct surveillance. But it also carves out a whopping 40 exemptions. Law enforcement officers will have wide authority to use surveillance drones, both with and without a warrant. Um, it also has broad exemptions for oil and electrical companies, real estate agents, educational institutions, and any areas within 25 miles of the Mexican border. Think what the National Security Agency can do with them. I'm really looking forward to hearing about them, and if we're lucky, to seeing some in action. Please join me in welcoming Mark Harrison. Okay, thank you. Is this thing on? No. Nope. How about now? One, two, three. One, two, three. Anybody? Yeah. Okay, is it? I, I hear my voice. Does anybody hear me? Okay, very good, very good. Okay, first, uh, thanks for the invitation. It was great to come up uh, to UC Davis. My daughter's here, so it's a great chance to see her this evening. She wanted to know why was I like coming up to see 200 other people is the only reason I'm coming up to see her as well. And I told her, this kind of stuff you see at home all day long. And I invited her to come, but she says, no, she's seen plenty. Okay, I've got a lot of things to show you, and also some interesting things, well, let's hope, to uh, tell you. But first I wanted to cover why is this an interesting thing to do? And I could think of no other better way of just kind of showing you some of the stuff that we've done in the past. So if we can get our volume up here. Okay, and then there's some uh, music coming. Just pretend there's like great, beautiful music. 
This is a little itty bitty plane. In fact, I've brought it here. You can you can see it up on the uh, up on the front table. That's uh, capable of flying inside. It's capable of flying outside if you have like absolutely no wind. But it only goes like three or four miles an hour. So if you're if you have wind stronger than that, it, it just flies away forever. And as mentioned, I, you know, I work at Pixar, and it's very nice because I have a nice big, uh, big atrium that's uh, very convenient to fly in after you're too stressed out from uh, all your various, uh, all your various work. It can also be uh, very exciting. So this is a friend of mine over in Germany. And he has done a great job of just sticking a, a GoPro camera onto his plane and then fly around uh, all these beautiful places he goes to. And it's really interesting because like, even just a couple of years ago, you wouldn't have been able to do this without you know, thousands of dollars of equipment, you know, your very own helicopter or something. But now, with a uh, relatively modest, modest hobbyist budget, you can do you know, quite a lot of things. Okay, so we'll just, uh, I could watch it all day long and I've seen it hundreds of times, so we'll cut that short. Now people often ask, why, why drones? Why do you mess around with drones? Uh, and since I basically work with software, the answer is pretty simple. Because every hobby I take up, I keep working until I'm able to reduce it where I'm sitting in front of the uh, television with a laptop. This guy, if you're familiar with Chris Anderson, does anybody know Chris Anderson, the, the, the maker guy? This is uh, him, he's, he's in Berkeley, so we uh, fly together. And the fascinating thing is he's sitting down there on his uh, computer and he's logged in to an airplane that's flying around in circles by itself and he's issuing all the diagnostics and debugging commands to the computer that's on board the plane flying. And he's able to tell the position, the location, the altitude, everything just by looking at the computer screen that he's not even looking up in the air at the plane because he knows where it's at. And it's really a kind of an exciting thing. If you went back like 10 years, this would be like a $100,000 project. If you went back five years, it'd be like a $5,000 project. If you go back even a year or two, but now you can do like a really low level project for 30 or 50 bucks. If you want to get fancy, have GPS, have telemetry downlinks showing all the status of your stuff, you can still do it for a couple of hundred bucks, which is uh, you know quite within the realm you know, of, a, of a lot of hobbyist stuff. You, know, you go to some concert or the other, or as I tell people, like you buy a Game Boy. Game Boy? Do y'all still use Game Boys? <laughs> Whatever the most recent console is, you could have a very nice, uh, nice uh, setup. 
Now, we're going to skip through a bunch of these slides because I've actually brought the things here that I can show you. But here is a pretty traditional drone setup. It's basically an RC plane. And inside the RC plane, you can see on the top is a downlink radio. Inside is a computer, which you'll see. And then the, uh, the square thing with the round button on top is a GPS chip. Just what's uh, the same as like it's in an iPhone or a car GPS. But there's the chip. If you have an Arduino program, you can read the data and know your location off of the chip. Here is some really ancient technology, maybe circa 2011. Back in the old days, you would build your own board and you would get some uh, gyros put onto the board, you have to solder it all together, and that would cost you about maybe like $150 or $200 to do so. And people were saying, wow, this is amazing. How can this stuff be so cheap? Five years ago, an autopilot board was like five or $6,000. Then of course, as soon as it catches on a little bit, manufacturers come along. This is the exact same board up on top. And they started uh, manufacturing it and selling it for about $50. And that was a, you know, an impressive price drop. This exact same board now is about $15. So if you hang on for a couple of years, you know, they'll be having to pay you to take them off their hands. OK, if you see here, this is basically an Arduino board. If you're familiar with Arduino, you'll notice on that blue board, you've got the pattern of the Arduino shield. And the red board, I mean, the, the blue board, uh, the red board has the Arduino, you know, the chip and everything. And then the bottom board has such electronics as uh, gyros, accelerometers, uh, barometer, battery voltage monitor, a lot of stuff that uh, you can use if you need to build an autopilot. And the stuff is just getting better and cheaper. Now you can get a 32-bit processor. It's awesome because you're running like loops and stuff around 5x the speed. So you get like even better resolution, better feedback from your sensors. And it does a lot of fancy stuff. Uh, we, we'll uh, see some of this later. So I'm going to kind of skip through that. But I'm going to come over here. OK, if I hold this stuff up, can y'all see in the back? Uh, can y'all see my hands? OK, good. So the term drone is fraught with controversy. Do y'all know like the term hacker? And y'all know that like people, like some people consider like hackers are people like good guys that play with computers, but in the popular press, hackers are like bad guys that break into computers and steal your money or whatever. And there's this constant back and forth, you know, who owns the name hacker. And it's kind of the same with the drones. There's the military usage of the word drone. If you show some, if you tell somebody drone, what they're likely to think of is kind of fuzzy pictures on the news of people getting blown up. And then the people who are working on drones get all upset, say, no, 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 that's not what it is. You're, you're, there's actually a lot bigger world of drone flying. And it's uh, a much more friendly thing. Our definition of drones that we go, that we use on DIY drones is, is basically anything that can fly itself. So some people will refer to anything that flies as a drone. Some people will refer to uh, the multi-copters like this as a drone. 
but uh, but our very strict definition is if it flies itself it's a drone and if you have to have somebody fly it then it's just a radio controlled aircraft I think we're on the losing ground of this so feel free to call them drones as you like and I will still talk to you so here's uh, what would be just a regular RC plane. As you can tell, it's got wings, it's got a tail, all the usual things. And you can imagine that if you had a radio remote control that could kind of move these control surfaces around, you could uh, make it fly around. But if you open up, well, we'll open this up later because it's got, oh, there we go, too much uh, tape and stuff. If you could see inside there, you would see that it has a GPS, it has all of the sensors, it can locate itself in the sky, and it has, uh, in fact, an Arduino-based uh, software program on the Arduino board that we can send it up in the air and have it uh, fly around. Now, this is great uh, if you're first starting out. It's really nice because you can put it up in the air and when you are thinking you're getting ready to, to, to crash, you can push the button and tell it to fly itself. And sadly, it flies itself like much better than I can fly. You know, like so many other human endeavors, it was, it was like when the, when the first chess program beat, uh, beat the grandmaster chess player. And a lot of people, huh, why would you bother playing chess anymore? But, uh, but for things like this, that's actually very good because then you can occupy yourself with other things. For example, like you can put a camera on there and then you can actually worry about getting nice camera shots instead of not crashing into somebody. So, and this is called a fixed wing aircraft because the wings are fixed onto the airframe. And you know what helicopters are, right? Remember those helicopters? Helicopters, well, there's, there's, there's a joke that uh, there's a really nice uh, model uh, RC airplane flight simulator that basically you take a roll of uh, 10s and 20s out to a field on a breezy day and then just kind of whoosh them off into the air and watch them blow away. And there's an upgrade for helicopters, which is you replace your 10s and 20s with 20s and 50s. And that's because helicopters are really complicated mechanically. If you think about like helicopter you've seen up close or on TV, it's got so many different moving parts. It's really hard to build. When you crash them, it's really expensive. And somebody came up with the idea what if we could do away with all the complicated mechanical stuff and replace it with four motors? And the idea was great, but the problem was, and I, and I think the very first guy that tried to do this, like in a full scale, was like back in the 1920s. But the problem is human beings just don't have the reaction time to keep something like this level. Because what happens is you've got all four of the props spinning, it's holding itself in the air, one of the props is a little bit stronger, so it immediately flips over and accelerates down. And you know, as you may see today, you only have about like a tenth of a second to respond, and the response is usually like slightly muffled verbal <laughs> but uh, with the addition of a CPU and sensors you can set it up such that the aircraft can stabilize itself so you can imagine how this thing flies right it's got the four props if you need to move in this direction, you spin these two props a little bit more, or these two props a little bit less, 
and that'll kind of raise one end up and it'll kind of go sideways. You, know, you can go back and forth. Same way for front and back. You can make it turn, yaw as they say, by spinning two of the blades faster and two of the blades slower because they're set up in pairs to rotate against each other. These, these two are going clockwise, these two are going counterclockwise. If everything is going at the same speed, then your, uh, you know, all the forces cancel out and it stays stable. If these two go faster, then there's more inertia on these blades and it'll twist in the air like that. And it turns out that's something that the computer can handle really well. You have some sensors, in this case gyros, which, uh, which measure you know, rotational twist, and it can figure out this arm is low, we need to speed it up. This arm is, uh, you know, is twisting this way, we need to speed up other motors. That usually happens in a control loop at about 400 hertz, so it's doing it like 400 times a second. You know, considerably faster than what a human being can do. The interesting thing is now, I'm going to take off the top here, and later you can come up and, uh, and take a look at all these. They are pretty sturdy. You can see it's got a relatively small control chip doing all of that. And because a lot of this technology is being driven by cell phones, it's getting cheaper all the time. Does anybody here have like a smartphone? Anybody have a Wii? And you'll know on those you have the ability to play games where you control by tilting. That's because there's a gyro uh, on the phone. And because you don't want to like carry around a big phone like that, they put it onto a chip and you get actually a three axis gyro, so you can measure rotation, you know, front, left, and, and around, and a three axis accelerometer, so you can see like the motion in each of the three ways. And all of that fits onto a chip now that's about uh, two mm to a side. It's really, really cheap. I mean, really, really small and really, really cheap that now it's like five or twelve dollars for a simple chip like that. So all that's great if you're, if you're interested in trying out this stuff yourself because you're not embarking on a hobby which is going to be thousands of dollars. You're going to be embarking on a hobby where the, where the basic pieces are in the tens of dollars. The other nice thing is they have invented foam core. Really worthwhile to get something like this because it gives you a lot of uh, nice control you know, for not a whole lot of money. Okay, these things are getting smaller and smaller. Here's that plane that was flying uh, through the miracle of pager motors. You can ask your parents what pagers were. Now you can have motors that uh, can run a really small prop. And if you can see this little board here, which is like the size of a small postage stamp, that has the radio, motor, controller, the whole works right on there. Likewise for quadcopters, you can get little itty bitty ones that are like perfect for flying indoors and there's really almost nothing to them. And as a result, they're also very uh, cheap. Okay, so in a minute, oh, I'm gonna do one more thing. I'm gonna kind of talk as I'm setting things up. So one thing that makes a lot of this possible is a LiPo batteries. Anybody, anybody heard, heard of that term? It's uh, cheap and powerful batteries, but you need to be careful with them. we're going to set up a little bit. Okay, while I'm doing that, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, since you can fall into the computer, can you hack into 
Yeah, that's a really good question. Can you hack into the plane and fly it yourself? And this is kind of following the early trajectory of computers. You know, it was such a miracle to get them to work at all. You never considered the problem of what if happens when it's in the air. And the one thing that saves you is that when you do the radio link, you'll generally bind uh, from your computer, from the radio that's attached to your computer to the radio in the plane, and that is bound, uh, you know, kind of like how like, like Bluetooth is bound. But uh, there's not a lot of security built in to, uh, into a lot of these hobby level stuff. I imagine if you get like military stuff, they have all kinds of stuff. Now, here's a, here, here's a note. I'm getting ready to like demonstrate this guy. Can anybody identify what I'm doing right now? Just shout it out if you recognize. Yes, I'm taking the sharp spinning blade off because you don't want to be standing here and do something stupid. For example, make the sharp spinning blade spin into your flesh. Now, have you all ever worked with computers? Have you all ever had like a typo? or click the wrong button. Yes, imagine that were to cause something to spin into your flesh. <laughs> that would not be good. In fact, let me jump forward slightly in my presentation. So if you are doing anything with this, if you're doing anything with any hobby, or any craft, or any machine tool, etc. you'll often see warnings that says something to the point of be careful. And you don't want to ignore those, even though it's inconvenient, because like in this case, you're spinning these things around very fast. And it might look like a toy, but it can actually you know, cut you you know, like on that model on the end, it has about the same power as a blender. But you'll notice on a blender, it's all nicely enclosed. And, uh, but the important thing is be careful. Follow the safety instructions. If you don't follow the safety instructions, be sure and upload the resulting pictures up to a forum so other people can learn from your mistakes. Okay, so what I'm doing now is I'm going to turn this guy on and you'll be able to see some of the autopilot uh, controls. Okay, that means it's ready to fly. Let's let it uh, come to its senses here for a second. this part of the demo later and you will see I'll also demonstrate one of the one of the less documented features of messing around with drones is the like 20 or 30 minutes standing around in complete befuddlement when things don't work so those of you up in the front can hear it's trying to do something but it quite hasn't figured out what to do Okay, there we go. Now if you look here, 
You'll see that these wing surfaces, they're called the ailerons, are what keep you flying level. Now you'll see here, I'm gonna tip this down like we're flying this way. You'll see this one is coming down. Can y'all see that in the back? And this wing surface is coming up and that'll push it until it becomes level. And when it goes the other way, it's gonna do the same thing. Now, if you watch the tail surface in the back, as it's diving, it's gonna try to level itself out. And if it's climbing too fast, it'll try to level itself out as well. And that is the airplane itself doing all of that. It's reading the gyros, it's reading the accelerometers, it's taking all the corrective action. And this is much different than a, uh, what, what a standard plane does because it's a doing it all by itself. Let's see. So we'll kind of let that, we'll kind of let him kind of uh, think about it for a while. There's some other stuff we can show, but that, uh, but that should be pretty good. So I think we're probably almost ready to set up and go outside. That's going to take a few minutes. But what we can do is prior to that, we might even be able to do a little bit of flying in here. tell you to run away in terror but uh, this guy flies on pager batteries as well so there's minimal there's minimal damage uh, this one here it costs about fifty dollars and th th and this is one of the nicer ones uh, and you can get them even a little bit cheaper for like about thirty dollars but they don't have such a nice uh, remote. But uh, oh, ask the question, but in a louder voice. Mark. Uh huh. Mark. Mark. Yes. How much damage does it cause when it lands on you? This one causes no damage at all. Yes, that, that, that's the beauty of pager motors, okay? Oh, so I shouldn't be wearing my helmet right now? <laughs> I think you should always wear your helmet at all times. There's no telling when you're going to fall out of bed. Can you make it past the roof? Uh, yeah, I think we can. Yeah, I don't want to stick it onto the light. <laughs> okay, so we'll uh, we'll land this guy here. And uh, any more questions? Uh, Do you want to take this? We'll take the big one outside and it'll take a minute or two to set up. And are we on good time? Yeah, we're in great time. Ah, super, super, super. Okay, let me see if there's any other important stuff. Okay, so uh, 
Okay, pop this up, and here, here's like a few of the websites. Uh, I, I have a blog, eastbay-rc.com, East where I, uh, it, it, it's basically kind of an ongoing journal of my ignorance as I'm trying to figure stuff out. So if you're interested in following along with what I do, uh, leaving comments, et cetera, et cetera, you can uh, leave it there. And I will put a copy of this presentation up uh, in case you want to get it. In case you just can't. You know, in case my deathless uh, prose is so... It, it, you have to have your own copy. They're reverse engineering them already, aren't you? Well, no, we're, we, that's our final project. Yeah. So oh, it is? We've been planning this. Oh. Actually, it was like the like first the day first I came day here, I was like, hey guys, let's build a quadricopter. And my roommate's like, so what's your name? I have it, I have it.